Well, hello, everybody. Um, what I really want to be able to say to you is that I'm so glad to see you. But of course, here we are meeting virtually. Um, I'm so looking forward, as I'm sure you are, to the time when we can come together for events like this in our spaces at Old South Meeting House and at the Old State House. But in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us virtually. Um, I know some of you have been attending our um, recent Reflecting Addicts events, um, and I'm glad to have you back. And some of us, uh, some of you are, are new faces, and so thanks for being here to join us. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be able to introduce today um, my friend David Silverman, who um, David and I shared a uh, dissertation advisor in graduate school. Um, I won't tell you how many years ago that was. It was probably just a few years back. Um, but uh, David has been an incredibly prolific scholar of Native American and early American history. He's a professor of history at George Washington University um, and is the author most recently of This Land is their land look at that i'm even i've even got a copy for you to see this land is their land the wampanoag indians plymouth colony and the troubled history of thanksgiving which came out just last year um, and right in time for the 400th anniversary of the founding of plymouth um, and of the first thanksgiving and of course here we are um, mid-october right between indigenous people's day and the thanksgiving holiday right around the corner so it seems like a really propitious moment for us to be talking about your work, David. Um, David, of course, as some of you know, uh, also has been working with us at Revolutionary Spaces on our Reflecting Addicts project. Um, he was one of the key scholarly advisors for our exhibit. Um, and last month he took place, he took part in a really fantastic panel um, entitled Christmas Addicts and the Politics of Liberty and Sovereignty, which sort of explored the three overlapping struggles um, for freedom that converged during the second half of the 18th century, not just the, the struggle for the colonies' liberties, but also the struggle of Native people for their sovereignty and the struggle of those in bondage to be free. Um, so we can certainly extend that conversation if people have lingering questions they didn't have a chance to ask at that event. But really, um, what I hope is that this will be an opportunity to hear David talk with us about his recent book um, and to um, give as many of you as would like to ask questions an opportunity to bring them forward. So um, we're not in person, so it's a little bit more uh, impersonal, uh, but I really want to encourage you to jump in. Um, don't wait. As soon as you've got a question, throw it into the chat box, which you can access from the bottom bar um, <clears throat> on the Zoom interface. And please make sure when you do put your question in there that you um, select the option to send it to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see the question, because I think that will help to build the dialogue. So let's try to make this as conversational as we can. Um, and um, maybe, David, if I can just cue things up by um just asking you in really broad terms um why you wanted to write this book and what you hope that readers will take away from it well thanks Dad, for having me uh, it's always great to have a chance to reconnect with you um and i love having the opportunity to uh, support the programming of revolutionary spaces uh, i love the direction in which this organization is going so thanks for having me um i would say there were, there were three major reasons that that I decided to write this book. First and foremost, I have a decades long relationship with Wampanoag people. Uh, the first book I wrote back in 2005 focused on the Wampanoags of Martha's Vineyard. And in the course of doing that research, I reached out to the Aquina Wampanoags of the island and developed some strong friendships and some strong professional relationships with members of the tribe. And over the years, I heard repeatedly from Wampanoag people how hard Thanksgiving season was for them, particularly when they were children or if they were parents and had children. And the reason they said was that, you know, when they were sitting in school and they were forced to participate in Thanksgiving pageants or to make construction paper decorations of happy Indians and pilgrims holding hands and making friends. Or when they were driving to the supermarket and they saw their neighbor's lawns decorated with those sorts of themes. They felt like at best history was being sanitized 
And at worst, that their historical traumas, which have been deep and significant, were being made light of by their neighbors during a national holiday. Keep in mind, Native people are our country men and our country women. And yet a national holiday was doing damage, active damage to them and to their children. And that resonated deeply with me. The second reason I decided to write the book is that over the years I've participated annually in teacher training institutes, uh, first through the sponsorship of the Smithsonian Institution and over the last 10 or 12 years uh, through the sponsorship of Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens. Uh, that's George Washington's ancestral estate. And these teacher training institutes involve these organizations flying in primary and secondary school teachers, you know, folks who are teaching elementary, junior high school and high school um, social studies and history courses, people from all around the country, they bring them in for a week or two of boning up on their content knowledge. Now, my job at these institutes was normally to speak about Native people during the Revolutionary Era or in other words, George Washington's relationships with indigenous tribes. Almost invariably, when I opened up these discussions to Q&A, what the teachers wanted to ask me about was not about George Washington and Native people. They wanted to ask about the history of the first Thanksgiving. And the reason was that all of them teach it. And all of them realized they didn't have even the basic content knowledge to do justice to the subject. So they were charged with this task, but they didn't have the tools to perform the task. And it seemed to me that writing a book that would strip away the mythology of the first Thanksgiving and take a hard look at the actual history of that event and its fallout would be doing justice, not just to Wampanoag people, but to the thousands and thousands of social studies and history instructors all across the country who reach millions of children across, across the nation. The third reason was that an anniversary was happening. Uh, the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower's arrival uh, is in 2020. And you know, for uh, reasons that um, I, I'm not in a position to explain, uh, anniversaries have this way of focusing the public's attention on historical events. Um, and so it, it seemed to me that it would be a lost opportunity if I let this moment pass to reach a, a general public with my specialized knowledge. Because I could write the same book in 2023 and it would have a, a much smaller audience. So th those are, are the three reasons. You know, in terms of what I hope the book will accomplish, I, th I think it's a, it's a few things. One is that I, I found that when I ask any reasonably thoughtful adult, and most adults are reasonably thoughtful, and I ask them, you know, do you think a shared meal is um, the best symbol we have for Indian colonial relations? Almost to a person, those adults will say, mm, no. And then I say, well, then why do we propagate this, this falsehood among our kids each and every year, because that's what, that's what we do. And then ask, you know, if you were a native person sitting in that classroom, as that falsehood is being propagated, how do you think you would feel? You know, so most say, oh, probably not very good. I say, well, do you consider indigenous people your countrymen and women? Well, yes. Then why are, we, again, once again, why are we doing it? And then I, I, I raise the question, do we need to attach this false history to the holiday? Because among the things that I chronicle in the book is that it wasn't until the mid to late 1800s that the story of pilgrims and Indians got attached to the Thanksgiving holiday. New Englanders and then Yankees more generally celebrated Thanksgiving for the better part of two centuries without any reference to pilgrims and Indians. It's a late 19th and mostly 20th century development for cultural reasons particular to those, those time periods. We don't have to attach this mythical history, this false and I think damaging history to the holiday. We can get together 
with family and friends and celebrate the goodness of our, in our lives without propagating a historical lie. And so what I'm asking is for us at this moment where, when we're reevaluating the racial roots of this country and its injustices to take a look at this annual ritual and think about the role it plays in, in that, that broader scheme. Thanks, David. That's, that's, a, that's a whole lot to think about um, and some really, really important insights. As you, I think um, your, that, that initial set of comments suggests that what you've done is, is written a book that's both about history and memory or um, the history of memory. And so I, I hope we can explore each of those parts of the book in a little bit more detail. Um, and I wanted to come back to the sort of like, well, you know, how do we equip people with knowledge of this period so that they can grapple with it? Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that I, I loved about your, your book, you have these, these wonderful reflections um, in the beginnings and endings of chapters where you really crystallize um, it in a way that, that feels immediate. And there's a passage in the book where you, um, you ask why we should continue to tell a Thanksgiving story that focuses exclusively on the struggles of the Plymouth colonists when, uh, as you point out, the challenges of the Wampanoag people um, in that very same time period were in many ways more severe, right? So what happens if we broaden our lens a little bit? So can I just ask you to help us understand that Wampanoag context for the first Thanksgiving, right? We're probably, more of us are familiar with the Pilgrim's context, although I, we probably all need a little bit of a, a brush up on that as well. But, but let's, let's look at the Wampanoags and, and help us understand the Wampanoag context for that first Thanksgiving and why, why, putting that, why putting that at the center of the story really matters. Sure. Um, let me start with a, a point that has less to do with history and a little bit more to do with civics, and then I'll get back to the history. And it builds on that very line from the book that, that you mentioned. When we ask our kids to participate in Thanksgiving pageants, what we ask them to do is identify with the pilgrims as we. The, the pilgrims are the proto-Americans. The Indians are the they. There is a not so subtle racial message in that. I participated in one of those Thanksgiving pageants and I sang my country tis of thee in which I praised the pilgrims as my, my fathers. My last name is Silverman. I have nothing to do with these people, but that ritual is asking me to identify with them as fellow white people and not to identify with the native people of that story as we. Well, I descend from neither group and the descendants of both groups are my fellow Americans. And so I ask all of us to just pause on the kind of cultural and racial programming that's going on in, in that kind of ritual. Now, as to your actual question, um, which is about you know, the historical background of the Wampanoags up to that moment. You know, the way the story is told, it's as if the Wampanoags were frozen in prehistorical time until the Mayflower arrived. And very often that is, that is precisely how we teach Native American history to the extent that we do it all in this country. It's that Native people are just stuck in Stone Age history until the people with real history arrive on the ships and inaugurate progress, which that from that point on is, is never ending. Well, you know, that is, patently false, of course. Um, and you know, one of the ways that we can cut through um, that falsehood is to dispense with some of the terminology that slips very easily off of our tongues that blinds us to the antiquity and richness of Native American history generally and Wampanoag history more specifically. Um, and the, the two terms that I would focus on is the idea that America was a new world and the second is that it was a wilderness. Not, none of those things are true. It wasn't a new world. The Americas was every bit as ancient and rich as any other part of the globe. 
right? Native just just people, ancient and rich in different ways. Right? Just ancient and rich in different ways. Native people had civilizations which had undergone millennia of development before Europeans ever arrived. And that long history shaped who these people were, what their priorities were, how their polities uh, were structured at the moment of contact. So part of what I do is in, in my first chapter, I call it the Wampanoag's old world, is I deal with those thousands of years of history leading up to that point. I think it's also important to note that the arrival of the Mayflower was no first contact episode. This is not the first time these folks have ever seen Europeans. Very often that's how it's depicted, right? They're, Wampanoag people are depicted in the story as naive and odd and shocked. They don't know what to make of these folks. Nonsense. They had a century of frequent contacts with a variety of Europeans, French, Portuguese, Dutch, and English. Those contacts began in 1524, not 16, 1524. And they became annual events, indeed, they took place several times a year from 1602 onward. These contacts usually weren't pleasant. Often they began with trade, but almost invariably they degenerated into violence. And that violence, as often as not, involved Europeans taking Native people captive, Wampanoag people captive, and transporting them across the Atlantic, sometimes for sale into slavery, but at other times to bring back to London for training as interpreters and guides. So part of the story that I tell to set up the meeting between the Wampanoags and the Mayflower is to point out that at least two Wampanoags had been to Europe and back. They had been to London. Uh, the, one of them, Squanto, who I'm sure many of your, uh, uh, your audience members knows, uh, he had been to Spain, England, from England to Newfoundland, from Newfoundland back to England, from England back to Newfoundland, from Newfoundland back to England before he returned to America. In other words, he had seen more of the world than the passengers of the Mayflower. He knew the sponsors of the Mayflower voyage. I, he, knew, he knew what made English society tick. So Wampanoag people are operating from a position of knowledge in all of this. Right, right. The, the interactions are so, had been so frequent that there's actually a body of expertise to be the go-between between the, in these encounters, right? I mean, that's, that's fascinating. There are fluent English speakers among the Wampanoags who knew London and its streets and its people well. Right. But the other essential background to this is an epidemic. Um, and we don't know what the identity of this disease was. I suspect it was smallpox, but we can't say for sure. Uh, contemporary accounts only say it was a plague, not the plague, but a plague. And Europeans, when they said a plague, it just meant a terrible disease. It struck the southern New England coast in 1619 and raged for the next three years. If you think this pandemic is tough, let me trust me when I tell you it's nothing in the scheme of global history. This, this epidemic between 1616 and 1619 wiped out certainly more than half of Native people between Southern Maine and the East Coast of Narragansett Bay, and in some cases wiped out some communities entirely. Problem for the Wampanoags was twofold. They had been devastated by the disease, but their Narragansett rivals to the West, on the West side of Narragansett Bay, had not contracted the disease. So in the wake of it, the Narragansetts were ascendant and the Wampanoags were weak. And the Narragansetts took advantage of the Wampanoag weakness to try to subjugate them to tributary status. It's at that moment that the Mayflower arrives and the Wampanoag sachem or chief, Massasoit, also known by the name of Usamequin, has a decision to make. Does he wipe out these newcomers because of the English track record of violence against Wampanoags over the previous decades? Or knowing that these people are dangerous and that they have metal weapons and tools that his people could use to defend themselves against the Narragansetts? Does he try to make an alliance with them and harness their material strength and their soldiery to use against the Narragansetts in order to maintain Wampanoag independence? That's the choice he makes. And the choice he makes is to reach out. 
It's not necessarily a popular one among many of his tribes people. And it's, it's out of keeping with the pattern of response to prior episodes of Europeans arriving in the Wampanoag country, right? I mean, this is for a very specific reason, a choice is made to try something different this time because it's necessary to survive, right? That's right. And it's necessary because of inter-tribal politics. And you know, one of the responses that I often get from my readers is they say, wow, I didn't know that, that Native American life was so complicated. Well, look, it's every bit as complicated as the politics of Europe. There are internal rivalries. There are external rivalries. There are various people jockeying for power uh, and dominance. And what happens is the English just become another player in that game. Um, I want to just put a pin in the piece that Massasoit is working to create, and that is, of course, bound up symbolically with our understanding of Thanksgiving, just because I think the, 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 um, the experience of disease that you just um, mentioned, and you made the connection between, you know, that um, pandemic and the one we've experienced today. I just wanted, I wanted to invite you to, um, to share any reflections you may have had since writing the book, right? So you wrote the book prior to, um, to the experience that we've had this year. Um, I'm sure it's been kicking around in your head as, as we've gone through, you know, this massive public health crisis. Has the experience of this year in any way, um, has your experience been informed by your work on this period of Wampanoag history or vice versa? Has your understanding of, of Wampanoag history been changed by your experience of this public health crisis? Well, I, you know, I think they're apples and oranges. I mean, you know, the scale of death that, that Native people experience with these epidemics, epidemic diseases utterly eclipses anything that our society has suffered. Uh, you know, by, by comparison, this is not to make light of uh, the many thousands of Americans who have died and suffered uh, under this pandemic. Um, but by comparison, this is a mere inconvenience um, to what Native, Native people had their lives shattered, their societies shattered um, by these, these epidemics. Um, what I have also found frustrating is, you know, during the period that I study, none of the historical actors have a convincing explanation for why these diseases are happening. Both native people and the English, the best explanation they have is that these diseases come from the spirits. The question is, which spirit for what, and for what reason? And there's, there's a robust debate. They don't know anything about communicability. They don't know how to prevent these diseases. What's been frustrating for me is we do know, and yet still, Yet still, we can't get the leader of the country to wear a mask and, um, and to prevent people from gathering together in companies of thousands to prevent communicability. Um, it's deep, deeply frustrating. Thanks, David. Um, so um, I feel like we ought to pause just on the Thanksgiving moment itself before we pass on to talk a little bit about how the piece that is forged in that moment um, falters. I, I think you, you suggest that Thanksgiving, the, the meal that we remember is really not, it doesn't deserve to be elevated. It, was, it, was it in any way part of the work of forging this, um, this piece? Um, what, how would it have signified to those who participated in it? It matters a little bit, but just a little bit. Um, earlier on in the relationship, Massasoit had sat down with the English leader of, of Plymouth Colony. Plymouth Colony at that point, by the way, is about 50 or 60 people. I mean, this is not a, a massive society. Let's be very clear. Uh, Plymouth Colony was about the size of a small Wampanoag village of which there were a great many. The Wampanoags outnumbered the English uh, at this point by at least 10 to one and probably 20 to one. So let's be, let's be clear about what the power dynamics are uh, here. 
Um, you know, so in uh, March, after the English settle at Plymouth, so they've, they've been there since December, um, Massasoit sits down with uh, uh, Jonathan Carver, the governor of Plymouth Colony, and you know, through the strained translations of Tisquantum or, or Squanto, they work out an agreement of mutual alliance, you know, that they'll trade together, that they'll come to one another's defense if the other is, is attacked. They won't steal from uh, from each other, and, and and so on and so forth. That's the the big deal in the relationship. After that point, there are moments in which Massasoit's life is threatened, and the English come to his defense, uh, and his life is threatened by the Narragansetts and by Wampanoag dissidents who are unhappy with his alliance with the English. Um, and the you know the English come to his defense. Okay, they prove to him that they will stand by their agreement. At one point, um, the Wampanoags hear gunfire at Plymouth. That's what brings them to the first Thanksgiving. They rush to, to Plymouth because they think it's under attack, either by the French or the Narragansett. So they're proving their reliance. Um, and maybe the most important event of all is there's another outbreak of disease among, among the Wampanoags. Um, it's a disease that kills Squanto, and that lays Massasoit and many of his, his villagers low. Um, and Edward Winslow from Plymouth comes to visit Massasoit thinking he's on his deathbed and begins doctoring him, um, even emptying his chamber pot. Uh, it's a really intimate medical moment and Massasoit recovers and then says to Winslow, listen, you need to go take care of everyone else in the village who's sick. And uh, Winslow says in not so many words, this was a nauseating task. <laughs> I mean, these people are really like, they have, they have bodily fluids oozing out of every orifice, and I, I'm doctoring them. That's a real gesture. It's an intimate and diplomatic gesture that proves to Massasoit that these English are his true friends. And in return, he shares some intelligence with the English. He says, uh, by the way, there's a coalition of Wampanoag and Massachusetts people that are planning on wiping your colony out. And the, you know, it, the, English, the English launch a preemptive attack and quash this supposed uh, plot. So those are the big building blocks of the alliance. Then the Thanksgiving feast happens. And it's, a, it's an extension of all these other events. In effect, it's somewhere in between a state dinner and an impromptu party. Neither, the uh, William Bradford, Plymouth's diarist, devoted two paragraphs to it um, in his account of Plymouth's early days. None of the diplomatic records between Plymouth and the Wampanoags ever mentioned the event again. Um, so it's a, mi it's a minor event in, in the broader scheme of Plymouth Wampanoag Alliance. Um, I see that we've got a question in the chat box, and I'm I. It's a great question, and we'll we'll um, bring it in a little bit later in the conversation. But I do just want to encourage um, all of you who are um, who are um, participating from uh, the other side of the screen to feel free to jump in with your questions. Um, we certainly are eager to um, to have them. So, um, David, I just before we shift our shift gears a little bit and focus on the the long memory of and contested memory of Thanksgiving, um, I just wanted to um, ask one more question about the the history itself. So, the peace that's forged in this early moment endures for a little more than 50 years before it collapses during King Philip's War or Metacom's War, and of course, it's under it's it's unraveling for a long period before then, if I, if I understood your argument correctly. That is the key um, point. <laughs> yeah, so I guess I, what, I'm, what I'd like to ask you to do is to tell us whether you feel like that outcome, um, the collapse of that piece was inevitable. Was there a, was there a realistic hope that this could have been an enduring um, thing in, uh, in the English colonies in America? Um, and if not, what are what are the things that cause it to unravel? So you know, let's start with the basic principle that native people in most colonial zones permitted the first colonists, almost in every single case, to settle in their territory. 
And they did so not because they envisioned these colonial settlements growing like Topsy and overrunning native people and displacing them. They permitted Europeans to settle in their country because they thought they would derive a benefit from them. And th that benefit would normally be in the form of trade or and military alliance. In those places where Europeans fulfilled those roles, the relationship could be enduring. And we actually have examples where that occurred. The French performed that role throughout much of Indian country. Not always, and let, me, let, me be emphasized, let me emphasize here. The French are no better than the English or the Spanish. Um, but in areas where they set up plantation colonies premised on growing crops that dis uh, on land that they had uh, removed native people from, their relations with native people were just as bloody. But in the deep interior of the continent, where the French presence was limited to trade posts and military forts, the relationship was sustainable because the French were providing what native people wanted. If Plymouth continued to fulfill the role that Massasoit had originally envisioned, if it had remained small and weak, while also affording Wampanoag people benefits, sure, the relationship could have gone on forever. But that's not the English intent. The English intend for these, these alliances to be temporary. And they intend for these small settlements to be beachheads for much larger migrations in which the colonists are going to replace or subjugate native people. And that European jurisdiction will be the law of the land. That not that Europeans are moving into native society, but that Europeans will take over Indian country and absorb native people into European rule. I mean, let's reverse the lens for a, a minute. Imagine a flotilla of Wampanoag canoes crosses the Atlantic and goes to England. They say, we'd like to build a village here. Yeah, uh, sure, you know, you know, we like your corn and your beans and your pots. And, <laughs> all right, sure, yeah, you, you could stay here. And then imagine thousands and thousands of more Wampanoags come and they say, well, now our law is the law of the land. I mean, the, the, the notion is preposterous, but that's precisely what's happening in reverse. It's unsustainable because native people aren't going to tolerate Europeans taking their land, subjecting them to European law, reducing them to servitude and slavery, or if they resist, death and displacement. And that's the pattern that plays out not only in Southern New England, but in one English colony after another, after another. No, coexistence is not, is not possible because indigenous people aren't going to suffer an invasion and subjugation. Thanks, David. Um, a question that's sort of a pivot to talking about memory, maybe. Um, there's another really poignant passage in your book. Um, at the end of your account of Pometacom's War, of King Philip's War, um, you conclude that account with a narrative of a very different Thanksgiving that happens at the end of the war. Um, can you just tell us about that and why you think it's important that we have that view of Thanksgiving in mind as well? Uh, sure. It's a dark moment. Um, so in the summer of 1676, after a year of resistance, Native American resistance uh, to colonialism led by Massasoit's son, Pometacom, who the English call uh, King Philip, the coalition of Native people who rose against the English and the colonists' Native allies goes down to defeat. And during the, uh, the long end to this war, a joint force of English soldiers and Wampanoags who had joined the English out of self-preservation late in the war kills Pometacom or King Philip. Indeed, the fatal shot is fired by a Christian Indian and Pometacom hated Christian Indians um, named Alderman. And the, you know, the commander of this force is Plymouth's captain, Benjamin Church. 
who wrote some really colorful accounts of the war in which invariably um, he's the clearest headed person and invariably the hero. Um, and with, the, with Pometacom's death, Church orders him to be decapitated and dismembered. And Church sends the head to Plymouth and Plymouth authorities mount it outside the walls of the town on the very site where Pometacom's father, Massasoit, had reached his Treaty of Alliance with the English and where that first Thanksgiving took place. And after mounting his head there, and by the way, leaving it to rot for 20 years as a symbol of conquest, Plymouth and Massachusetts colonies held days of Thanksgiving uh, to give praise to God for saving them from their savage enemies. And the reason that I, that I include that Thanksgiving is that that's the more apt symbol of Indian colonial relations. A shared feast is the exception to the rule. The rule is violent conquest. The rule is colonists inflicting death and dispossession on indigenous people. And we shouldn't sugarcoat the story and we shouldn't forget the story. That history is fundamental to this country and its culture and its structure. Um, and I, I think it's, it's a powerful corrective. Yeah, it's, it is powerful for sure. Um, it, it's, yeah, I found that a, a deeply disturbing um, part of your book, but, but yes, a very important um, piece of the story. So, if we can just shift our focus from the from that historical moment to um, to your treatment of the memory of this passage in in early New England, um, why do you think that it's the other myth, the Thanksgiving myth we know and love, that is the one that became so prominent? What what accounts for that being the the dominant story? Well, I, there's a couple of, of different reasons. I look, think about all of the Indians who are remembered in early American history. There are always Indians who helped. Pocahontas, Squanto, Sacagawea, right? The native people who seem to facilitate their own people's displacement. Um, we don't remember the majority of native people who resisted, who saw white American expansion as an evil, as robbing them of their birthright. Um, so that has something to do with it. It's a feel-good story. It makes it seem like Native people consented to their own colonization, right? So, you know, wh why the norm in the normal Thanksgiving story, why do Native people reach out to the English? Because they're friendly. Not because they had suffered an epidemic disease and they were at risk of being subjugated by the Narragansetts and they knew that the English had these terrible weapons because they had uh, been on the other side of them so often. No, 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 no. It's because they're friendly. And they share a meal with the English after making friends with them, and then they just go away. Right? There, there's no bloodletting. There's no betrayal. There's no enslavement. There's no decapitating and display of body parts. They just go away. It's like manifest destiny in the colonial era. Um, it's God's will for the great Christian democratic beacon to the world to emerge out of Plymouth Colony. So part of it is that it's a sanitized story that allows white Americans to feel better about their country. The other reason has to do with timing, the timing of when this story emerged. And it emerges in the mid to late 19th century at a time when Protestant Northeasterners were feeling deeply uneasy about the course of, here it is again, immigration to the country. Catholics were flowing in by the tens and hundreds of thousands, soon to be followed by Jews and Eastern Orthodox Christians. 
Well, here we have a story that makes white Protestants' ancestors the progenitors of America. Now, keep in mind, 1620 is not 1776. The, the English of Plymouth have no conception of what they're laying the foundation for. They have no ambitions to create an independent country from England, right? They have very modest ambitions and they're very short term. But the story is that they're planting the seeds for the United States and everything that's great about it. And so the Mayflower Compact becomes the proto-United States Constitution. These, uh, these, uh, these separatists who found Plymouth, who have no interest in tolerating other people's religious views, become progenitors for American religious freedom. And, you know, and right on down the line. Um, you know, they come in family groups. Well, very few colonies are settled by people arriving in families. Most colonies uh, consist of down and out single men who are of college age, um, who create societies that resemble fraternities um, more than, you know, what we imagine in the Thanksgiving, first Thanksgiving setting. So, you know, it's a feel-good story in all kinds of ways, but it also establishes the cultural authority of Yankee Protestants, which is what Yankee Protestants wanted at that moment. And Yankee Protestants controlled the levers of American history education. It's the most literate region of the world. Uh, the a disproportionate number of the professional historians came out of places like Harvard and Yale, and then wrote dissertations and books that uh, lauded their ancestors. Um, and eventually, you, this uh, this myth enters the school curriculum, and uh, people like me get indoctrinated with it. People like the children of Wampanoags get indoctrinated with it, and it becomes the founding story of the colonial era for the United States. Yeah, the staying power of the story is really remarkable. Um, and, and maybe more remarkable when you, when you give it the specificity, you know, the, its origins lie in a very specific moment, a very specific period when um, the progenitors of the myth felt threatened, right? But here we are, you know, many, many years later, and it's still a warm and fuzzy story we like to tell ourselves. Um, one of our members um, asked a very, uh, a, a question that bumps up against our contemporary politics, but I, in this context, I wanted to bring it forward. Um, he, he asks, you know, what's your thinking about the push from certain elected officials to teach only patriotic history and how we can counter that push, and I guess what I'd like to ask is whether the staying power, in your mind, the staying power of this particular myth, is it bound up with that kind of politics, right? We, we have a very specific story we need to tell ourselves about what this country has up to. Um, and it, is that how we understand, how you understand the, the endurance of this myth? Oh, there's a lot of reasons for the endurance of the myth. Um, Part of it has to do with the thrust of that question, which is there's a sizable portion of the American public um, that believes and has always believed that the purpose of a history education is to cultivate patriotism. Well, you know, and coming from the current president, or if you went back to the 1980s from Lynn Cheney, I mean, you know, this, this debate has been going on my entire adult life. What these folks want is not people who actually know history, they're trying, they're trying to cultivate voters of a particular persuasion. So let's be very clear about what's going on here. My job as a historian is not to cultivate patriotism. If that's the result of my scholarship, fine. But that's not my job. My job is to teach people to view a complicated history in all of its complexity. That's my job. And if you come out of that loving the United States or being critical of the United States or hating the United States, that, that, all that is neither here nor there for me. I understand why politicians concern themselves with it. But again, their interest is not in getting the history right. Their interest is in training the next legion of voters for their party. So, you know, I take that criticism from the White House with a grain, a, junk, a chunk of salt. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but there are other reasons why this, this history hasn't been corrected. I mean, one is that Native American history has never been taken seriously in American public education. I don't know any 
high school or junior high school history or social studies teachers that are well equipped to teach this history. And I've talked to hundreds of them. What's more, the, their curriculums are, are structured by state guidelines that don't take Native American history seriously. So until our state educational standards change, the history curriculum isn't going to change. And then there's another reason too. And that is that Native American people have not had much of a voice in our civic life over the years. And you can contrast the difference with how Native American history continues to be ignored and misrepresented in the schools versus what's happened with black history, African American history over the previous 50 years. African Americans make up a much larger percentage of the population. And though, though they, don't, uh, they don't enjoy anywhere near the amount of socioeconomic uh, uh, equality and justice that they deserve, they have far more power in American public life than Native people do. And so as a result, African American history has become mainstream in American history curriculum um, to the good. Um, but it all makes the, the absence of a robust, complicated, nuanced Native American history that much glaring. That much David, more glaring, rather. David, do the, do the, is it, is the nature of the sources that we use in doing Native American history part of the, the, the explanation for the differential weight given to the subject matter? We, uh, one of our members has asked about sources. You know, if Native people didn't use a written language, how is it that we, how is it that we know about the Native American historical experience, their memories and histories? How has that been preserved? Is that part of the why this is? this piece of the story has been given short shrift, at least until very recently? I think it's a minor element of it. I think it's an element um, because Native American history is three times harder to tell than that certainly of any white group um, and, and even of African Americans during the colonial period uh, who also rarely exercise literacy even as they live cheek by jowl alongside literate people. Um, but I think the, the relative lack of written sources from firsthand Native people is only a minor aspect of it. Because if you go to any set of official colonial records, go to the index and look up which entry is the longest, invariably, it's Indians. And there's a good reason for that. Indians were most of the people in America throughout the colonial period, well into the revolutionary era. They controlled most of the continent into the mid 19th century. They were critical to every single colony's military affairs, political affairs, and economic affairs. They could not be ignored and they would not be ignored. So, even though Native people are very rarely, not never, because there were some literate Native people over time who had acquired literacy in missionary context. Nevertheless, Native people routinely interacted with Europeans and made their voices heard. And we get Native critiques of colonialism in records controlled by colonial sources, um, which tells you that these folks had a way of getting their point across. I think we also have to keep in mind, you know, colonists were not all of the same mind. Even in just New England, you have several different rival colonies. Rhode Island didn't get along with Massachusetts um, or with Connecticut. Um, within these colonies, there are different factions duking it out. And almost invariably in these battles, the English will try to draw native people over to their side and use them to their ends. What's more, the English also face the French, the Dutch, who are also in, heavily involved with Native people and have their own gloss on Native, Native affairs. You have not only uh, uh, English colonists who are politicians, but who are missionaries, and missionaries very often are the deepest critics of their own societies, because no society ever lives up to a missionary standard. Um, you have fur traders who 
also don't get along with the missionaries um, because they trade liquor and guns and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, in, in some cases, you just have English people who live alongside Native people as neighbors and have developed warm or antagonistic relationships with them. Because a place like New England was the most literate place in the Western world during the 17th century, with the possible exception of Sweden, we have an abundance of written records relating to Native people. Now, can we tell the Native side of things with the depth that we wish? Certainly not. The English rarely paid any attention to Native women. Okay, well, there's half the Native population. Never any attention to Native children. Okay, well, there's another quarter of the population. Rarely pay attention to Native elders. They're de most interested in Native military affairs, politics, and economy, not religion. Um, not mundane economic affairs. So, you know, there's only so much of the story we can tell, but we can tell some of it with a great deal of depth and complexity. And we're the poorer for it if we don't. Thanks, David. Um, there's so many more questions that I would love to be able to have the time to ask you, but we are truly out of time at this point. So just one final question. Um, from the chat box, which is, um, I think, for readers who are interested in exploring more, um, are there, do you have recommendations of books on the history of Native people in Southern New England after the 17th century um, that you would direct people to? One or two good books that you think well, first on the list would be this land is their land, but um, you know, uh, with the exception of that, uh, you know, my my friend and colleague Dan Mandel, Daniel Mandel, um, has written two really excellent books um, on Native American history at, after King Philip's War. One is called Behind the Frontier, uh, which deals with Native people in Massachusetts in the 18th century. Um, the other one is called Tribe, Race, Nation, if I'm remembering the title correctly. Um, that's about the 19th century. That, that is a terrific, terrific book. Um, uh, there's also a wonderful collection of writing by modern indigenous people uh, called Dawnland Voices. It, it's a compendium of native essays and poetry and meditations, which are from native people themselves, very often reflecting back on this history and more recent history. And it's a perspective that you won't get from a historian like me um, and is well worth considering. Fantastic. Well, we have reached the end of our time here today. So thank you, David, um, for joining us. And I hope to have the opportunity to bring you back to continue this conversation again sometime down the road. Um, and thanks to all of our members for being here today. Um, it's so great to uh, be able to share this conversation with all of you. Um, and just looking ahead briefly as we close, um, I wanna call attention to um, some upcoming Revolutionary Spaces events. If you are um, putting together plans for, uh, for uh, the, your cultural activities online during the coming weeks and months, um, our next Members View event is um, Massacre and Memory, and that will take place on Wednesday, November 18th at 5.30 p.m. Our very own Matthew Wilding will um, host a virtual tour exploring the complicated history of the Boston Massacre. Um, da uh, David mentioned our strange fascination with anniversaries, so this being the 250th anniversary of the massacre, we, we got to get it in, right? Um, but how that event, not just the history of the event, but how it's been used um, as a political symbol and a tool for, um, for change over time. So um, please consider joining us for that on the 18th. And then our next Reflecting Addicts public panel is called Demanding Freedom, Addicts and the Abolition Movement. And that will take place um, later this month on Tuesday, October 20th at 4 p.m. Um, and we have a great lineup. The speakers for that panel include Christopher Bonner of the University of Maryland College Park, who's the author of Remaking the Republic, Black Politics and the Creation of American Citizenship. Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley College, just around the corner here. Um, she's the author of Force and Freedom, Black Abolitionists and the Politics of Violence. Natalie Joy of Northern Illinois University, whose research looks at the connections between Native Americans and abolitionists in the 19th century. Um, and Steve Kantrowitz, uh, who also was a graduate student um, at uh, Princeton when David and I were there, um, but who's now at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as the author of More Than Freedom, Fighting for Black Citizenship in a White Republic. So I hope you'll consider joining us for that. 
Um, and uh, to find out more about these events and other things that are coming up, please, if you're not already doing it, consider following us on social media at Revolutionary Spaces and continue to look for the Members View newsletter um, as well as our bi-weekly organizational newsletter. So thanks again, David. Thank you, members. And until next time, stay well. Mm -hmm.